Hi, I'm Dr. Mike McKinnis, one of the chief educators at Doctors in Training, and I want to welcome you to the Solid Anatomy course. We're very, very excited about this course. We've had feedback from many students requesting a DIT anatomy course, mainly because gross anatomy is such a challenging subject for so many students. Before we get started, I want to highlight a few features of our course. First, in addition to watching the lectures, each video has a study guide. In the related links, there's a link to a PDF of the study guide that you should download and print out to follow along with each lecture. These study guides are written as short answer questions for you to answer throughout the lecture to facilitate active learning. We'll put the question numbers and the answers on the screen for you to fill in as you go. Then you can use these study guides to quiz yourself later, or better yet, quiz yourself with a study partner. The second feature I want to mention is the clinical correlations. Throughout the course, we will add in clinical correlations that relate to the content being discussed. This is a way of relating the grueling anatomical details to concepts that you will actually see in the future. I remember studying anatomy as a medical student and getting bogged down and frustrated trying to see how some of this stuff related to my future as a physician. So these clinical correlations will help you connect the dots between anatomy and clinical medicine. Depending on your school's curriculum, we might introduce some clinical concepts that you're unfamiliar with, but making these associations early on will give you an edge when you see them again. Our hope is that the clinical correlations will not only make you a better clinician, but also help you perform well on both board exams and your gross anatomy exams. Also included with each lecture is a mock practical section. Most gross anatomy courses have a lecture component, a dissection component, and a lab practical component. But students don't often take the time to practice identifying structures in a timed setting. So at the end of each lecture, we provide an end session quiz, which will contain some high yield short answer questions, and also a mock practical, which is a chance to label anatomical structures in a timed setting. Now for our solid anatomy series, we're very fortunate to have Dr. John Phelan as a guest educator and as our primary lecturer in this series. Dr. Phelan is an associate professor at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas, Texas, where he teaches both gross anatomy and cell biology. He's won several student-selected teaching awards, and he's a very popular and entertaining lecturer, as you'll see. Now, on to the lecture. This is the first of four lectures that make up our Introduction to Human Anatomy. I remember as a brand new medical student feeling like I was learning a whole new language. In reality, I think a better analogy is that medicine is the new language, and that learning gross anatomy is just learning a new alphabet. So in this video, we're going to cover a brief history of anatomy and some fundamental basic anatomical terminology. And then in the second half of the lecture, we'll be discussing the skin. Now, I'll be back later for the clinical correlation and the end of session quiz and to help demonstrate some things with Dr. Phelan. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our lecturer, Dr. John Phelan. This introductory lecture for the Doctors in Training Solid Anatomy course provides definitions of terms that will be used freely in subsequent lectures and gives an overview of some of the biological systems that are found in all regions of the body. No doubt you're aware that the study of anatomy focuses on the structure and function of the human body. The word anatomy is derived from Greek words that mean to cut open and apart from, which is how anatomy was learned, by cutting cadavers open and taking them apart. The word is thought to have been first used by Aristotle, who wrote volumes on human anatomy, but ironically never cut open a cadaver because human dissection was banned in Greece during his lifetime, as it was during the lifetime of Hippocrates, the father of medicine, whose studies preceded those of Aristotle by about a century. They both performed extensive animal dissections, however, and extrapolated their findings to humans, which unfortunately resulted in quite a few inaccuracies and misconceptions about human anatomy. The original father of anatomy is considered by many to be Herophilus of Alexandria, who lived less than a century after Aristotle during a brief period when the ban on human dissection in Greece was lifted. He is said to have dissected over 600 bodies, possibly including live prisoners, depending on which sources you believe. All of his works were lost a few centuries later when the Library of Alexandria burned, but not before influencing Galen, a Greek who moved to Rome where, you guessed it, human dissection was banned. Galen, relying on what he learned from animal dissections, was extremely prolific in his anatomical descriptions, and many of the anatomical names used today were originated by him. 
His works were the gold standard in anatomy for centuries, which was somewhat unfortunate because, again, many of his extrapolations from animals to humans were inaccurate. It wasn't until 1,500 years later that Vesalius produced an intricately illustrated seven-volume series titled The Fabric of the Human Body that was based on his extensive dissections of human cadavers in Italy and that corrected Galen's errors and provided a very accurate and complete depiction of human anatomy. Vesalius named anatomical structures in Latin and Galen named them in Greek. Today, the anatomical names we use are a collection of Latin names like piriformis, which is a muscle acting on the hip joint, Greek names, which often end in X, like larynx and thorax, or os, like the azygos vein, Latin words derived from Greek words like carpus, the Latin word for wrist, which is derived from the Greek word carpos, Anglicized versions of Latin and Greek words like external abdominal oblique for the Latin obliquus externus abdominis, and occasionally even eponyms like the suspensory ligaments of Cooper in the breast. Sometimes there is not a clear consensus and you may hear two or more names used for the same anatomical structure. For instance, the passageway between the nasopharynx and the inner ear is called the auditory tube, the pharyngotympanic tube, and the eustachian tube with varying frequency. Throughout these solid anatomy lectures, we will endeavor to use the names most frequently used in the clinical setting, while noting the other names you may potentially hear ascribed to any given structure. Anatomical structures may be named according to their function. For instance, the flexor digiti minimi muscle of the hand, which flexes the smallest finger. According to the muscle or organ they supply. For instance, the superior pancreatico-duodenal artery, which supplies the pancreas and the duodenum. Or, according to their shape or appearance. In the latter situation, the resemblance may be obvious, such as the soleus muscle, which is shaped like the bottom of a sandal and is named for the Latin word for sandal. But the resemblance often requires some degree of imagination, such as in the case of the socket for the hip joint, which someone named the acetabulum after its alleged resemblance to a vinegar bowl. When physicians and other health professionals discuss their patients or the human body in general, the only way they can accurately communicate is if they are all speaking from the same point of reference. Thus, all clinical and anatomical descriptions of the human body reference it according to one universal posture or orientation, which is known as the anatomical position. When the body is in anatomical position, it is upright, with the feet flat on the ground, toes forward, lower limbs together, the back straight, the face forward, the eyes gazing straight ahead, and the upper limbs straight and at the sides, with the palms facing forward and the fingers outstretched. A variety of terms of relationship and comparison are used when referencing structures in a body in anatomical position. The word structure, by the way, is used as a general term for anything in the body, a nerve, a muscle, a blood vessel, an organ. When you open up the thoracic cavity of a cadaver, you will see quite a number of structures, for instance. The front of the body is the anterior or ventral surface, while the back is the posterior or dorsal surface. If someone were to ask you to name a structure that is posterior or dorsal to the sternum, which is colloquially referred to as the breastbone, you might answer the heart or the esophagus or the vertebral column. The sternum is anterior or ventral to all three of those structures. The sternum is also superficial to the heart because it is closer to the surface, and thus the heart is deep to the sternum. Furthermore, the sternum is also superior to the knee 
because it is closer to the top of the head, and the knee is inferior to the sternum because it is closer to the bottom or plantar surface of the feet. The midline of the body is drawn from the highest point on the skull, or the vertex, through the center of the body to the ground between the feet. When comparing two structures in the body, the one closer to the midline is medial to the other structure, and the one farther away from the midline is lateral to the other structure. Notice that in anatomical position, the little finger, or digiti minimi, or digiti quinti, since it is numbered the fifth digit, is medial to the thumb, or pollux, and the pollux is lateral to the digiti minimi. Consider, if you will, the upper limb. The elbow is said to be proximal to the wrist because it is closer to the attachment of the limb to the body. Distal and proximal are used in other situations as well. For instance, when comparing branches of a nerve or blood vessel. The branch closer to the origin of the nerve or blood vessel is proximal to the one farther from the origin. A pair of comparison terms you'll hear most often in embryology are rostral, which means towards the beak, and caudal, which means towards the tail. Cranial, which refers to the cranium, or skull, means towards the head. For maximum enjoyment, these terms can be combined. For instance, the umbilicus, which is the preferred anatomical term for the navel, or belly button, is inferomedial to the nipple. There's also a set of terms to describe sidedness. For instance, the lungs are bilateral which means there is one on either side of the body. The spleen, however, is unilateral. There is just one spleen, which is found on the left side of the abdominal cavity. The word for same in Latin is ipsi, and when two structures are on the same side of the body, such as the right eye and the right ear, they are said to be ipsilateral. The right knee, and the left ankle are contralateral because they are on opposite sides of the body. In radiology, you'll hear references to the planes in which images such as x-rays and MRIs are taken. The median plane passes through the midline of the body, perpendicular to the ground, dividing the body into equal left and right halves. Sagittal planes are parallel to and lateral to the median plane. Some terms you may hear used synonymously with sagittal planes are mid-sagittal, parasagittal, and paramedian planes, the latter especially in regard to a sagittal plane that is close to the median plane. If you hear the term coronal plane, consider that corona is Latin for crown, and think of the way a crown positioned on the head would cut through the body. A coronal plane passes through the body perpendicular to the median plane, dividing the body into posterior and anterior parts. Transverse planes are oriented at right angles to sagittal and coronal planes, and thus divide the body into superior and inferior parts. Radiologists often refer to transverse planes as transaxial or axial planes. Just about every solid anatomy lecture includes discussions of skeletal muscles and their actions, so you'll be expanding your vocabulary with a collection of terms of movement. Here are a few general ones to get you started. Flexion involves decreasing the angle between bones or parts of the body, while extension increases the angle. Flexion of the hip joint decreases the angle between the superior and inferior halves of the anterior side of the body. Extension increases that angle. Flexion of the elbow joint decreases the angle between the forearm and the arm. Extension increases it. Abduction involves moving away from the midline of the body, while adduction involves moving towards the midline. 
When we abduct our shoulder or glenohumeral joints and our hip joints, our extremities move away from the midline of the body. Adducting these joints moves the extremities towards the midline. Joints that are capable of all four of these motions are able to perform an action called circumduction, where all of these motions combine to result in a circular motion. Be aware that circumduction is different from rotation, where a part of the body rotates about its longitudinal axis. When the hip joint and the glenohumeral joint are medially rotated, the femur and the humerus rotate toward the midline of the body. When these joints are laterally rotated, the femur and the humerus rotate away from the midline. Welcome back. I want to talk about some of these anatomical terms as they relate to radiology. Orientation can be confusing as you begin to look at radiographs like x-rays. Now we'll use the example of a chest x-ray as a starting point. I don't want to get into the nitty-gritty of interpreting chest x-rays, but I do want to introduce you to the orientation as it relates to these anatomical terms. The chest x-ray, commonly abbreviated CXR, can be either a posterior anterior view, which we call a PA view, or an anterior posterior view, which we call an AP view, or sometimes a lateral view. Now the PA and AP chest x-ray, that's describing the relationship to the x-ray beam. So if the x-ray or the radiograph was taken where the x-ray beam went through the patient from posterior to anterior, that would be a posterior anterior radiograph or a PA radiograph. You might hear it called a PA chest x-ray or a PA chest film. We've got a hundred names for it. But the important thing is that it's PA. So the x-ray beam is going through the patient from the back to front, posterior to anterior. And then to actually capture an image, you put the unexposed x-ray film up against the anterior surface of the patient's chest. Now, if you were going to do an AP film, the x-ray beam would go through the patient from anterior to posterior, and the film would be placed against the patient's back. Now, most often you're only going to see AP chest x-rays in a patient who's incapable of sitting up or standing up for a PA view like a patient in the ICU who's sedated, hooked up to a ventilator and a dozen different machines. In this case, you'll order an AP chest x-ray, and all they do is put the x-ray film behind the patient or underneath the patient as the patient's lying down, and then the x-ray beam goes from anterior to posterior. Now, in radiology, the closer an object is to the film, the more clearly the borders of that object will show up on the radiograph. Since this is true, the PA view is normally preferred over the AP view because most of the important structures you want to look at are things like the heart and the great vessels, which are located more anteriorly. So when you look at the film, the left side of the patient's body is on the right side of the image as you face it, and the right side of the patient's body is on the left side of the image, it's just like you're looking at the patient face to face. So look at the question in your study guide. What plane does a PA chest x-ray represent? That's a coronal plane. You've sliced the body perpendicular to that median plane, dividing the body into anterior and posterior. Then the other common chest x-ray view is called a lateral view, where the patient is turned sideways to the x-ray beam, again, usually with the film placed on the left side closest to the heart. And we do this to get a more three-dimensional perspective. If all you have is a PA view, and you see density right here, you won't really be able to tell if that's a mass in the lung, or a mass in the heart, or even in the chest wall. But by doing a lateral chest x-ray at the same time, you can tell if that lesion is anterior to the heart, up in the chest wall, or if it's in the lung tissue posterior to the heart. And sometimes small abnormalities can be hidden behind the heart or behind the diaphragm, and you won't be able to see them at all without the lateral view. So the next question asks, what plane does a lateral x-ray represent? And this is a sagittal plane, because you're looking at the body parallel to that median plane. And then just as a side note, MRIs and CT scans are usually displayed as transverse planes, so you're looking at the body in cross-section. These are typically oriented as though the patient is lying on his back, which we call supine, and his feet are pointing at you. So just like with our PA chest x-ray, structures on the left side of the patient's body, like the heart or the spleen, will be displayed on the right side of the image as you're looking at it. All right, let's go ahead and get back to Dr. Phelan. If you're dissecting a cadaver in conjunction with your human anatomy course, you've probably regarded the skin thus far as something that is in your way, a curtain that must be drawn back as quickly as possible to reveal the structures you're interested in finding. 
The skin actually represents the largest organ of the body. And since it's typically given such little regard in the laboratory, let's take a few moments to discuss it. The skin is part of the integumentary system, which includes hair, nails, and sweat glands. The skin prevents dehydration, regulates body temperature by evaporation of sweat, and is the site of synthesis and storage of vitamin D. The skin can also be thought of as a broad sensory organ covering the entire body because sensory nerves end in every square millimeter of the skin. The skin is composed of the epidermis and the underlying dermis. The epidermis is sparsely innervated and avascular, relying on diffusion from the dermis for nutrition. The top layer of the epidermis is composed of dead, keratinized epithelial cells that are constantly shed and replaced by cells migrating from the bottom of the basal layer. The keratinized epithelia is largely responsible for preventing dehydration. The basal layer contains the melanocytes, which are responsible for skin color. The dermis is a highly vascular, dense layer of collagen and elastic fibers where the majority of cutaneous nerve fibers end and where the hair follicles and sweat glands are located. Evaporation of the secretion of sweat glands on the surface of the skin assists in thermoregulation, as does the dilation and constriction of the small arteries in the dermis. Welcome back. Now I want to talk about the dermis in a little more detail now before we go through the end of session quiz. There are collagen bundles in the dermis which are arranged mostly in parallel rows that keep the skin under constant tension. Lines of tension follow the general direction in which the collagen bundles are oriented. The anatomist Carl Langer is known for his creation of Langer's lines, which is a map of the direction of the lines of tension in the skin of the entire human body. It's referenced by surgeons prior to making incisions. If an incision is made perpendicular to the tension lines, the collagen bundles will pull the edges of the wound apart, resulting in a gaping incision that's more difficult to close and leading to excessive scarring as the wound heals. Incisions made parallel to Langer's lines are under less tension, so they tend to retain a slit-like shape, making them easier to close, and then they heal with less scarring. So, if you're making an incision in a patient's skin, you need to remember to make any incision parallel to these lines of tension. Now, if the lines of tension are disrupted, the patient can get a keloid. Well, what's a keloid? A keloid is a growth of benign fibrous tissue. These occur because of altered wound healing, where you have overproduction of extracellular matrix. Now, even though keloids can occur with a disruption of Langer lines, some patients are just more prone to forming keloids in general, and they're going to form keloids despite an incision that's made parallel to the line. Keloids are generally more common uh, in patients of African or Asian descent. So let's move on now to the end of session quiz. You'll get more out of this quiz if you try to answer these questions on your own rather than just writing down the answers I give you. So I want you to pause the video, answer these questions on your own, then restart the video and we'll go through these together. Let's get going. First question, define the following anatomical terms. Now, a few of these weren't discussed in the lecture, but they're still important to know. So superior is nearer to the head, inferior is nearer to the feet. Ventral or anterior means nearer to the front. Dorsal or posterior is nearer to the back. Medial is toward the midline. Lateral is toward the outside, away from the midline. Rostral is toward the beak. Caudal is toward the tail. Cranial is toward the head. Proximal means nearer to the point of origin. And distal means farther from the point of origin. Superficial means nearer to the surface and deep is farther from the surface. Peripheral is farther from the center, and obviously the opposite of peripheral would be central. Parietal pertains to the external wall of the body cavity. Visceral pertains to the covering of an organ. Mid-sagittal or medial section divides the body into equal right and left parts, so right down the middle. Parasagittal or sagittal section divides the body into unequal right and left parts. Horizontal plane divides the body into anterior and posterior parts. 
Transverse section or axial view is a cross section in the horizontal plane like the CT or the MRI that we talked about. Oblique is a slant from the axis of the body. Flexion is bending of body parts. Extension is straightening of body parts. Abduction is pulling away from midline. Adduction is moving toward the midline. Supination is turning the palm up like holding a cup of soup in your hand or turning the sole of the foot in. Pronation is turning the palm down or turning the sole of the foot out. Contralateral is the opposite side of the body and ipsilateral is the same side of the body. Next, when looking at a posterior anterior x-ray, a PA x-ray, which side of the patient's body is on the right? So it's the left side of the patient's body that's on the right side of the image. Like we said in the clinical correlation, it's just as if you were looking at the patient in person, face to face. Next, what's the difference between circumduction and rotation? So circumduction is the term used where all four movements combine to form a circular motion. So flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction all combine to form a circular motion. And then rotation is where a part of the body rotates about its longitudinal axis. Next, what layer of the skin contains the melanocytes? This is the basal layer. Okay, we're almost done. Now for your mock practical, we've provided some images for you to label in a timed setting.